be soon I'll get used to this. All right, thank you. I am now recording. Okay, and here we were just showing lazy execution in Scala, writing lazy here takes this block and freezes it, and then the block is unfrozen when we actually use it. You can think of this as a demand-driven program. So something only gets executed, in this case, two plus three, or the entire block, actually, only gets executed when there is a demand for it, okay? And we saw that here. It's here this is where I needed to know what Y was. This is where the demand was, and this is where it's thawed out. You can tell that the thawing happened because we saw computing printed. Okay, you can think of object-oriented programming as data-driven programming, and this this sort of lazy uh, programming is demand-driven. And then, what happened to computing here? Well, for efficiency, the value of this block was cached somehow inside of Y. So here, uh, since the value is cached, saved, uh, we don't have to execute it again. That would be inefficient to do two plus three twice. And it just tells you, well, in my cache, my value is 25. Okay. So we'd like to add something like this feature, but way cooler to Jedi. And uh, we have two versions of uh, two forms of lazy execution. We're going to call them thunks and texts. And thunks and texts are, you can think of them as two different kinds of ice cubes. Okay, so when I say an ice cube here, what I mean is taking an expression, an expression lives in the expression hierarchy, right? Not the value hierarchy. Uh, we're going to take some expression. And uh, we are going to put it in a container, a block of ice, if you will, that will allow us to smuggle it into the value side. So the container will look like a value, but inside that container is actually uh, hiding in there is an expression. And the two kinds of containers, two kinds of ways of doing this are thunks and texts. Okay, and we're going to introduce some syntax for this. So freeze an expression. So when we call freeze, these are special forms. Freeze takes an expression and puts it inside of a thunk. Delay takes an expression and puts it inside of a text. Now you can think of freeze and delay, thunks and text as sort of two competing forms of lazy evaluation lazy execution. So here is an example uh, of a session. So we're now in Jedi 2.1. I'm going to define x to be 5. And I'm going to define promise 1. Sometimes these delayed objects are referred to as promises. I'm not going to compute it for you now, but I promise that I will compute it for you later if you want me to. And then, of course, our big hope is that you won't want me to, and so I won't have to do any work, hence lazy. So here I'm uh, defining, uh, here I have a block. In the block, I define x to be 10, and, uh, and then the value of the block is 2 times x, but frozen. And then uh, promise 2 is exactly the same thing, but I'm going to use delay. So freeze two times x is going to create a thunk containing two times x. Delay two times x is going to create a text object containing two times x. Okay, and here we see uh, the difference between a, a thunk and a text. When I ask what's promise one, the answer is 20. Okay, and that's because it's so obviously when I'm saying two times x, x is being interpreted as x equals 10. Promise two, the two times x here, x is being interpreted as the global variable x equals five, okay? So what's going on here is that a thunk created by freeze 
remembers its defining environment, its freezing environment, if you will. Okay, so it remembers the environment in which x was 10. Delay two times x, okay, uses its thawing environment to figure out what x is. So promise two was thawed out at the prompt where x is five. And so, okay, well, two times x, x is five. So the answer is 10. Okay, so it's, this is a close cousin to static scope rule versus dynamic scope rule. Okay, and it's also a bit of a problem, you know, with text. So we're going to be, we're going to be, uh, going to be casting shade on texts here in a moment, for the same reason that we, you know, cast shade onto uh, dynamic scoping. You can't really control your your thawing environment. Um, so, uh, so sometimes there are problems uh, with texts. Okay, so we're gonna have that feature and that's quite easy to add. Next, parameter passing mechanisms. Okay, so here is, um, here is, this is good stuff to know, like for job interviews, you know, grad school interviews, um, things like that. So what are the parameter passing mechanisms? JEDI 2.0 uh, uses what we call eager execution. You remember what that means. If you look at funcall.executes, step one is we execute all of the operands, operands.map uh, of underscore execute to produce the list of arguments. We execute all of the operands so that we get and operands or expressions, remember, we get out of it a list of arguments, arguments or values, okay? Um, that's called eager because we do it in step one. We execute all of those operands. Well, what if we didn't need to know all of those operands? Well, we would have done some work there that we didn't need to do. All right, sometimes uh, eager execution is also called pass by value parameter passing mechanism. Okay, because we, uh, we compute the values of the operands. Or, but that was a problem. That turns out to cause a little bit of a problem. For example, remember conditionals, conjunctions, and disjunctions they all required lazy execution. Remember how you execute a conjunction? Hopefully. Conjunction uh, dot execute. You execute your operands from left to right until one of them produces the answer false. At that point, you know it's a conjunction. If anything is false in a conjunction, sorry, my nose itches. If anything's false in a conjunction, boom, the whole thing's got to be false. What about the rest of the operands, the ones you didn't look at? Doesn't matter. Don't care. Okay. Uh, conditionals. You execute the condition. If it's true, you execute the consequent and ignore the alternative. If it's false, you execute the alternative and ignore the consequent. It turns out that that kind of stuff is necessary. You know, otherwise, for example, you, know, you could never write a recursive function, right? Because uh, if you wanted to know what zero factorial was, well, yes, n is equal to zero is true. And so the answer is one, but you also have to execute, if you're eager, you're going to execute, well, what's uh, zero times factorial of minus one, which calls factorial of minus two, factorial of minus three, you go down like a little infinite rabbit hole. There are computer languages like Haskell here. And Haskell, instead of using eager execution, uses a lazy parameter passing mechanisms. Operands are executed if and when they are needed. Okay, uh, and by doing that, they don't need special forms. 
You don't need special forms, the things that are lazy, because everything is automatically lazy. You can define your own, uh, programmers can define their own conjunction function, they can define their own, you know, uh, if else function and so forth. They're just ordinary functions in, in, in Haskell. So there are two approaches to implementing lazy execution that you should know for some future job interview, pass by text and pass by name. Pass by name operands are turned into thunks and pass by text operands are turned into text, since the name pass by text. Okay. Um, so, Here's, uh, so you can already kind of do this if we have a uh, freeze and delay from the previous example. Here I'm defining a function called ignore param. This is a function, lambda, it's got two parameters, x and y, and it returns two times x. Notice that it ignores y, y wasn't used. Why did I put it there? Well, just to give you an example. Now I'm going to call ignore params, and uh, x is going to be 3, and y is going to be 10. But uh, 10 here, first of all, I'm going to put it in a block, and the block's going to produce a side effect so we can see if it's being executed. And now I'm going to freeze the whole thing. Okay, And this gives me 6, because 2 times 3 is 6. But you don't see, but, but the, the value of y, which was this thunk here, that value of y was never computed, right? Because we didn't need it. There was no demand for it, so it wasn't computed. Same thing would happen with delay. So I do the same thing with delay. There was no demand for this delayed, this delayed block. Computing y was never printed. And so, uh, you know, so we, so it was ignored. Okay, so again, pass by text. So that's where operands are turned into texts and um, produce some weird example, weird effects. Remember, we're gonna throw shade on dex. Here, I'll define x to be five. I'm gonna define add 10, lambda of z, and then inside I define x is 10, and uh, the body is gonna be z plus x. So if I call add 10 and I pass in frozen x, now x here is five, so this is a frozen five, it returns 15. So x here is gonna get thawed out and be five, and this z, I'm sorry, z is frozen x, okay, and x is five. So z, when it gets thawed out, produces five, and this x here must be referring to this local variable, x is 10. And so we get the value 15. Calling add 10 again, this time I'm gonna pass in a text, delay of x. Here again, x is this five up here. I'm gonna delay looking it up in the environment. Okay, and now we're gonna go in here. So this, this text five is z. Delay of x is gonna be z. We're going to come in here, we're going to thaw this thing out, but look at this, the thawing environment for this, in the thawing environment, x is 10. Remember, texts use their thawing environment, not their freezing environment for, you know, for variables, for identifiers. So when it gets thawed out in an environment where x was 10, and so this is going to become 10 plus 10, which is 20. And so that's undesirable because, you know, the caller here, you know, let's say add 10, this definition of add 10 is written by, you know, some software company. And here's the customer and he calls add 10 and a freeze of X. And he knows about X equals five, but he doesn't know 
that add 10 also as a local variable named x, right? So, and here he finds out when he gets this weird answer, he was expecting 15, right? Didn't he freeze x equals five? No, he froze x, but when x got, he froze x and it was bounded to z, but when z got thawed out, it got thawed out in a place where x was 10. That's where we said, hey, what's the value of x? And then um, finally, we're going to add um, we're going to add this feature called memoization. Memoization is just a fancy word for caching. So here, I'm going to define promise three. I'm going to have this block. The value of the block is two plus three or five. But the block first, before it computes two plus three, it has the side effect of printing out following a thunk. Okay, and now I'm gonna demand, I'm gonna try to thaw out promise three. And you see following a thunk, the side effect that gets printed out. And then this is the value of promise three. However, the second time I thaw it out, it just returns five. Okay. In other words, it cached the result, it stored the result. So after the first time it's thought out, it doesn't have to compute two plus three again. That's handy if instead of two plus three, this is a calling some function that took you know, 20 minutes of computer time to work out. We don't have to do 20 minutes of computer time twice, we just do it once. Okay. So that um, is that is uh, are the, a demo of texts and thunks, freeze and delay. And so now, how are you going to implement it? The first thing you're going to do is you are going to uh, add. Sorry, this lined up. You're gonna add two new classes to the value hierarchy. And you're gonna add some text enclosure are both values. Okay. Text contains in it, the body of a text is some form of an expression. The body of a closure is some form of expressions. Remember what I said, text enclosure are, are containers that hide an expression inside of them and make them look like values. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hang on a second. Let me start over again. Text extends value and text hides inside of it as an expression. Closure, we already have. That's already there. And a closure is very similar to a thunk, okay? It has a body, an expression. You can think of a closure as a way of, of uh, you can think of a closure as a way of, of in hiding, encapsulating expression, and smuggling it into the value hierarchy. Closure also has a defining environment. And the closure also has a parameter list, which isn't shown here. Thunk, extends closure. The only difference between a thunk and a closure is that a thunk doesn't have any parameters. Parameters is nil. A thunk also has in it a cache, which is the value of the thunk, which is initially null. So a thunk is going to inherit this environment and it's going to inherit this body. It would also have inherited the parameters, but it doesn't use, it doesn't have parameters, it's parameters. Put it another way, a thunk is a parameterless closure. A thunk, the main difference between a text and a thunk is that a, theft, a text doesn't have this environment. Here's the complete definition of text right here. Okay, so put that in a file and you're done. Thunk will need to override the apply method 
and it's going to call super dot apply but pass in nil okay remember apply inside of closure once a list of arguments is input okay well there are no arguments here and so he's just going to call super dot apply and pass in the empty list Okay, and it'll also need uh, to cache the result of apply on the first call. So you can use this cache. If cache is equal to null, you know this must be the first call. And if it's not equal to null, just return the cache. Don't even bother. Next, we're going to introduce two new. Um, classes of special forms, make text and make thunk. These are special forms. Make thunk has a body and make text has a body. The execute method, they'll both need executes. Make thunk creates and returns a thunk. Make text creates and returns a text. So that'll be easy to do. Step three, uh, you have to uh, enhance JEDI two parsers. Okay, so here uh, are the, is the term parser for JEDI two parsers, lambda, uncall, block, literal. We're going to add, uh, oh, Duncan text now. Mm, hang on. Mm, yeah, this should have been freeze and delay here. Um, <clears throat> so, so far. Pretty easy. And then one final modification that we need. Um, let's go up and see that. So remember, let's see, where's a good example of this? Here, for example, so if I, here I have x is equal to 5, I don't have an example of this here, but if I type in x, okay, it returns 5, obviously. Now, where is, who's returning the 5? Well, x, what kind of an expression is x? x is an identifier. Okay, so identifier.execute will look up x in the environment, see that the value is 5, and it'll return 5. Okay, here I'm defining another identifier, promise1, and here's another one, promise2. Now when I type in promise1, that's an identifier, so we're going to go to identifier.execute. Identifier.execute will look up promise one in the environment, but what it's going to find is that promise one is a is a thunk. Okay. And when it sees that it's a thunk, it's going to have to do one extra st step, which is it's going to have to thaw the thunk out. Okay, so it has to check if something is a thunk, the thunk has to be the thunk has to be executed. That produces the value 20, which gets printed out. Same with promise two. It'll look up promise two, okay, and it'll discover, oh, promise two is a text. So in other words, identifier.execute has to treat thunks and texts uh, differently. Here it'll extract out the body of promise two, okay, which is this lock, uh, let's see, what's it? No, it's this guy, two times x, and it'll execute two times x and return the value. 
So that means that we're going to have to go into uh, here, uh, identifier.execute. Uh, and if it's a thunk or a text, we're going to thaw it out. The thaw thunk, we simply call it supply methods. You can do it like this. And if it's an identifier, then we extract out the expression body and execute it in whatever the current environment is for the identifier. Okay. So uh, let's see, I'm just taking a quick look here to see if I've got this. Um, see if I could have the wrong uh, workspace open in my Eclipse. All right, I don't know um, how much code I have in here. Mm, yeah. Sorry, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this for you here because it looks like I don't have, um, looks like I don't have closures in this version. What about the other version that I was just looking at? Maybe I can find it in the version that I just had open. I have no idea what we're going to be seeing in here. Um, let me see if this has got, yeah, this looks pretty full version. I don't know if it actually works or not. Shall I give it a whirl and see if it does work? Oh, like some environment variable sets. Let me get rid of that argument. All right. Let's try one last thing here to see if I can get this thing running. Looking for something called scope tests. Oh, why is that? Why can't I get rid of these things? Yay. Okay. So um, find x equals ten. X is defined p one to be um, Okay. 
Okay, now P1, I froze that, so P1 should be a thunk, but when I type it in, notice that the thunk gets thawed out. E2, oh, I meant to write delay there, not freeze. Um, delay it, freeze it. The thoughts that should have been twenty. Oh, that's P P two. Gosh. All right. Well, I don't want to like um, we are getting this. I would have thought that it would have returned twenty though. All right, so let's, I'll give you a little tour of this code. This is code from a couple of years ago, so I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna find in here. So um, here is text. Oh, so this is a little bit more elaborate. Um, so um, text doesn't have a defining environment. It has a calling environment. Here's its cache, here's its body. If the cache is empty, then I'm gonna execute the body relative to the calling environment and store that in the cache, and then I return the value of the cache. By contrast, here is thunk. It's got a body and a defining environment, and it extends closure. Closure wants three inputs. It wants a list of parameters. Well, there are no parameters, a body and a defining environment. So I'm just going to pass those into that. Here is my cache. I have that equal to underscore. Okay. Uh, maybe that should have been no. I'm not sure why I'm using underscore there. But, uh, and then here's apply. Um, and let's see, this is a thunk. Um, oh, yeah. So this, I'll redefine it here. This is for the next feature. That's why I'm getting different answers. So this is what yours would look like. So, uh, so you're gonna call super.apply of nil, store that in the cache and return the cache. Okay, on the other hand, let's take a look at the identifier situation here. Here's my identifier class. Okay, and uh, here's identifier.execute. So it's taking this and it's looking it up in the environment. Remember, this is, uh, this is environment.apply here. Okay, and, and in case uh, it returns something of type thunk, then I call the thunk, you would just have emptiness here. In the case it's a text, I'm gonna call the text, apply text.apply, but I'll pass in this environment. 
And in case it's any other value, I'll just return what that value was. I have this in the parameter here, which is another feature that we're going to talk about. Okay, and I think in my parsers, did I do parsers? Um, yeah, here I have a freeze parser. And uh, it calls, it creates a make thunk, and here's delay, and it creates a make text. Um, this static versus dynamic scope rule. Um, I think I'm going to take this out of the assignment. Okay, and it's, otherwise the assignment's going to be too long, and I know, you know, special circumstances. We're going to take it out. Okay, but um, but it's a good source of final exam questions. Okay, so uh, here, what I'm going to assume is we're going to add this to Jedi context, this flags object. Okay, and this is going to be like a bunch of flags that we're going to use to control the features of Jedi. Okay, so uh, here we have a flag static scope, which is by default true, but if you set it to false, then the dynamic scope rule will be used. And then here we have the parameter passing flag. And there's three possible values for that: by value, by name, by text. Okay, we're going to come to these in a minute. But for now, we're going to assume that the static scope rule flag is set to false. Okay, and what that means is that closures, when you execute a closure, you use the calling environment rather than the defining environment. Okay, so. Uh, here, uh, as this example of is small, I don't know why this is shaded, that's a bug, but uh, remember this example, I define an absolute value function here. I define a global variable delta equals 100 here. And I define is small, which has a local variable named delta, and then it returns a function, a closure, uh, that uh, the body of the closure is absolute value of x is less than delta. And then the question is, well, which delta are you talking about? You're talking about this delta that's in the defining environment of the lambda, or you're talking about this delta, which we see here when I call is small, okay? Uh, this delta is in the calling environment. Okay, and here with dynamic scope set to uh, static scope set to false, this returns true. 99 is small, and that's weird, right? Because why is that weird? Well, because 99 doesn't seem that small, does it? Okay, so, um, so that is what happens with that flag. So here are the customizations that we're going to uh, make to Jedi. We're going to have these flags. You don't need the static scope rule flag. I won't make you. I won't make you put that in. It makes your code ugly. Okay, but you're going to have this parameter passing flag, so you can control how parameters are passed. The default will be by value, which is eager execution, which is what you've already got. Okay. Now, remember, let's take a look at some code again here. I think I have it. Let's look at fun call. Okay, so. Here is fun call. Remember, I began uh, traditionally args is, uh, is this, 
We're going to go down the operands. Operands is a list of expressions. We're going to execute each operand and we're going to get a list of values. Okay, but here what I'm going to do is a slight variation. Uh, flags.parameter passing match. If it's passed by name, then I'm going to go down the list and I'm going to make funky. Don't need this environment. Won't need that. I'm going to go down the list and I'm going to make a, a funk out of each flag, out of each operand. Um, operands.map new funk. Okay. Um, no. You do need an environment there. If it's by text, then the operands are converted into text, and otherwise they're converted into just ordinary values, whatever their value is. Okay. So, uh, so then when you execute the body, where's the uh, body of this thing? Um, um, Do I need this? Uh, if it's a thunk, then I apply the thunk. Yeah, I'm not going to show that to you because I'm not sure that I need that there. Um, but that's the because we've already got we already got it. And, we got it in identifier. Let me just think about that for a second. Um, so if the, we've got this list, we're going to execute the function. The body of the function might, yeah, I think we just, just can you just, uh, that's the only thing that I think you need is just this redefinition of args, okay? Uh, instead of converting, executing everything, all of the operands, you either uh, freeze or delay them. You either turn them into thunks or text, depending on if it's passed by name or passed by text. I think that's all you need and it should work. I'll test it out. Get back to you if that's wrong. Okay, so uh, so just to recap then, you're gonna add these classes to the value hierarchy, text and func. You're going to add these classes to the expression hierarchy, make text, make func. You're going to add some new parsers. I'll fix this up. I'll correct this here. So instead of thunk, this will be freeze and delay. Give you the syntax for those. Okay. And you're going to modify identifier.execute so it automatically thaws out identifiers that are associated with thunks or texts. Then you're going to add this object to uh, the context package, okay? And then you're going to modify funcall.execute so that if it's passed by name, it turns all of the operands into tech into thunks. If it's passed by text, it turns all of the operands into text. And if it's passed by value, it just executes the operands normally. All right. Questions. Yeah, I'm being asked by um, Samija if it's due Friday or Monday. I believe Monday is the due dates.
355. Okay. Um, so let's introduce Jedi 3. See what that's got in there. Fortunately, Jedi 3 is not too complicated. Okay. Um, so uh, Jedi 3, the big difference here is that, or the big addition here is, uh, I think, variables. There are a few other things too. Okay, so, so far, uh, we don't have any uh, concept of variables, okay, uh, in Jedi 2 or even Jedi 2.1. There's no variables in there. So, um, which makes Jedi 2.1, you know, kind of like a nice, pure, functional programming language. So, Jedi 3, we're going to mess it all up now, and we're going to add variables. And um, here is the, uh, here's a demo. I'm sharing the right thing. Yeah, here's a demo of this. So I'm going to define count, and here we're going to have a new kind of a function, var. A var takes some expression as an input, and it executes that expression, and it puts that into a brand new kind of a value called a variable. So for us, Variables are just a new kind of value. Okay, now I'm trying to keep up with these. So now I say, okay, that's cool. What is count? Notice that count is zero, but it's got these brackets around it. Okay, so count is not, this is a little bit more specific than what we see in normal programming languages. Normal programming languages automatically give you the content of a variable. Here, we just give you the variable. If you wanted the content, then you have to automatically, this is called dereferencing. Hang on, I'm getting bunch of chats going on. Um, all right. Um, bub, 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 bub. So, all right, so everybody's confused about the due date here. Um, all right, let's see. Jedi 3, it does say do uh, May 1st. All right. So May 1st is Friday, you're saying? Is that true? Today is the 28th. Wednesday is the 29th. The 30th is Friday. All right. Make everybody happy. I'll change the due dates to Monday. Is that what I want to do? Let's see, our class is Tuesday, Thursday. I'll even change it to the fifth. How's that? That'll really make your world good, right? And then, uh, so if it was due May 5th, that would give you Tuesday, Monday office hour. No, I don't know, May 5th. Seems like I don't want to get to May 5th. Fourth, you'd have the office hour, give the grader time to grade it. All right, I'll leave it at May 5th. Yeah. Okay, so is everybody, let's see what's going on. Oh, you want to change to May 4th. Okay. All right, enough chat. Let's go back to business.
which is, and I've lost track of where I am. Okay, so we're paying attention now again, right? So count is a variable containing zero. I ask what's count, and I don't get zero, but I get zero with these crazy braces around it. If I put the braces around count, then I get zero. Okay, so, so count itself is count itself is a uh, is a bound to a variable. And if you want to know the content of count, then you have to explicitly dereference it with these braces. This is an assignment operator. Okay, so it's a new kind of operator that we've added to Jedi 3. Okay. Um, this would just be single equal sign in Java. We're using colon equals because I hate the single equal sign to mean assignment. Equals should mean equals, I think. Colon equals was used in Pascal, so I kind of like that. So I'm updating count, the content of count. Okay, the new value of count is the, this would be the value stored, the old value stored inside of count plus one. Now, when I ask what's count, it's a variable containing one. Notice that if I did this, hey, what's count plus one, I get an error message, okay? Uh, so plus can only be, this should have said chars here, not text. You can't add something to a variable. You can't add one to a variable. You can only add one to a number or a string. So, so you get this error message. If you really wanted to add one to count, you would have had to say count in braces plus one. Okay, let me see if I have a picture of this coming up. I don't, so I'm gonna try something out on you. I am going to draw a picture for you. That pen. Oh, this pen's good. Eraser. Okay, so hope everybody can see this. This is actually, I think it's pretty good. Okay, so this is what um, a variable looks like. Okay, a variable is a box with uh, a value inside of it. Okay, so in this picture, you see the global environment. And this is right after I've defined count equals def count equals var zero. So this put into the global environment a binding for the identifier count, and the value it's bound to is not zero, but it's a box with zero in it. Okay. Next, I'm going to execute this assignment command here. Count colon equals content of count plus one. This is what the environment looks like. Okay, so this is important. Uh, a lot of you are going to mess this up when you go to implement this. Okay, it does not change an assignment command, colon equals the assignment command. The assignment does not change the binding in the environment, it changes the content of the variable. Okay, so count is still bound to the exact same box. It's just what's inside the box is changed. Okay, so when you implement uh, the execute algorithm for assignment, 
And most of you, not most, some of you are going to get this tragically wrong. And it is something I asked the grader to look, to look out for and to swoop down on you if you, you screw it up. Okay, so assignment does not create a new bound, binding. It just changes the content of a variable. The variable has two parts to it. There's the box, which is the variable itself. And then there's the value inside the block box, which is, we call that the content of the variable. Okay, and older languages like C, the variable is sometimes referred to as the L value, and the content is referred to as the R value. I'll explain why in a little bit. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. Well, if variables are values, then does that mean that, that variables can contain variables? And the answer is, well, sure, why not? So here I'm defining p count, and it's a variable, but the content of this variable is the count variable. So when I ask what p count is, look at the way it prints out. It's a variable containing a variable containing zero. In order to extract that zero, I have to do a double dereferencing of the variable. Let's draw a picture. That's So this is what the environment diagram looks like now. Okay, so count is bound to that variable. P count is bound to a variable, but the content of that variable is, I'm drawing it as a pointer here, a, a pointer to the count variable. Now, let's see, do I have... Now, that might sound you know, crazy to you, and it is crazy. You know, let me pull up a, uh, a text pad here. So um, we do see this um, in languages like C. All right, I can do, here's some C code I'll do for you. Okay, so in C, and also this would be true in Java as well, okay, uh, there are no constants, there are only variables. So here uh, I've declared count to be a variable of type int, okay, and its content is currently zero. So the environment diagram here is just like we saw before. And if I wanted to, if I wanted to increment count, I would do it this way. Okay, again, you do the same thing in C, in, in Java. Now, a couple of things about this line of code here. Let's go through it. So C, uh, the rule in C and the rule in C++ and Java is if, the, if the, the name, if the variable occurs on the right-hand side of an assignment, then C assumes that you mean the content rather than, than count being you know, the variable count. Count here is interpreted as the content, which is zero. Zero plus one. If count appears, if a variable appears on the left hand side, then it's interpreted as the variable, not the content. It would make sense, right? If this is the content, we would be saying zero equals one. Well, 
What does that mean? That we're unhappy with zero, so we wish it was one? No, here count is the variable count and I'm loading it with the, with the old content plus one, I'm changing the contents, okay? That's why when we say in C a variable has two values, the L value, the R value, the L value means the left value when it appears to the left of the assignment and that's the variable. And R value is the value is the content when it appears on the right hand side. So this is messed up because, because the interpretation of count depends on where it appears in an expression. And, and, and I don't like that. And so that's why in Jedi, uh, count only has one value, okay, which, is, which is the variable. And if you wanted the value of it here, for example, you would need to explicitly dereference it. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna dereference it for our program, we're just gonna make them do it. However, that said, you can, you can suppress the auto dereferencing. Check this out. Here I'm declaring a new variable, p count, and p count is int star. Okay, um, what is that? Is that the same as int? No. Okay, uh, int star means in C the address of a variable containing an int. The address of a variable containing an int. Okay, uh, you know, C is so crazy and so poorly designed. Um, I mean, C was designed to be the implementation language for Unix. Yeah, that was the whole purpose of C. Uh, C was included, a C compiler was included with Unix, and that's how, and Unix was free, at least to universities, and uh, that's how C became so popular. As an implementation language for an operating system, you know, it's very close to assembly language. C is sometimes called a high level assembly language. Okay, and, uh, you know, and, you know, and so you can do all of this weird stuff like you can talk about addresses in it. And star is crazy. I mean, star has about 10 different meanings I can think of in C all depending on the context. And here, in this particular context, right behind the name of a type, it refers to the, an address, the type of all addresses of variables containing int. And then look over here. Here is my count variable, but I'm putting this ampersand in front of it, okay? And, and so that means the address of the count variable, not the content, but the address of the variable itself. Okay. And so basically, you know, if I printing, if I did something like this, I have switched to C for that class. So I'm going to print out P count with prints. Something like uh, um, it's going to print some hexadecimal number. digits in there. Four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-four. Eight, yeah. So it'll print out some crazy hex digit, which is an address here, right? And then if you wanted to know what was in p count, you'd have to dereference it. And this gives you two dereferencing, and this prints out uh, one. 
It's the content of the content. Okay, so you can, so there is some precedence for having variables containing variables in C, and, and they use this, you know, C programmers, you know, love to do, you know, address arithmetic and all kinds of dangerous stuff. Okay, so I am out of time, which is perfect. Uh, we're going to skip store so you are not doing stores that'll make your life a little bit easier. Uh, and then we'll also inter introduce iteration a while loop. And we'll do that on Thursday. Um, all right, so questions. No. no. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll schedule an office hour for Friday. Uh, you should, I've given you an extension on the homework, um, but you should still try to aim to have JEDI 2.0 working by Friday. JEDI 2.1 is not hard, but it's uh, it's sort of mind bending a little bit. So you know, it takes a while to understand concepts like funks and texts and what's going on there. I do want you to understand that. And uh, then, um, and then what else? And then the concepts really aren't that hard in Jedi 3. All right, you are welcome and I will uh, see you all later. <laughs>